why light pollution control is important for the bird-friendly city. I'm Roland Deshane, and I'm a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So what is light pollution? It's wasted light at night, and it's a broad term. It encompasses overlighting, a glare, uh, as examples here, a couple of headlights. We also have uh, something called light trespass, which is uh, light shining where it's not wanted, where it leaves one property and enters another. There's also visual clutter, and probably what most people think of when they hear the term light pollution, sky glow, which is the overall brightening of the night sky. So light at night impacts the circadian rhythm. And what is that? That's an internal body clock, a biological clock that runs on molecules. And the key um, molecule is melatonin, which is like a conductor for an orchestra. And over the course of 24 hours, it will regulate different processes so that things are done most efficiently and not in opposition to other processes. And I'll touch on that in the next slide. So the daily light cycles are what keeps that in sync together so everything works in, as one. And melatonin, again, is the key molecule that keeps that circadian rhythm going. Now, blue light at night messes with this timekeeping and creates biological chaos. So here's an example here. Um, if we look at the top curve, we've got our melatonin. And the blue swaths the, are the nighttime periods. And at night, the melatonin levels build up. And that is true as long as there's not much blue light at night. So once the melatonin is elevating, it triggers things like cortisol, which is an anti-stress uh, hormone. And that also builds up over the course of the night as the body does restorative work on the damages that were done over the previous 24 hours. Uh, it also controls a, a spurt of growth hormone just prior to that cortisol. And in the bottom curves, I've just repeated it a couple of times, but those are uh, different parts of our immune system. And you can see how they elevate and wane throughout the uh, course of 24 hours. And the lymphocytes, the white blood cells, are very elevated at night. And this is key for building up our immune process in humans. And it's also true for animals uh, such as birds. So, do we see these effects in birds? Let's take a look. So, we can't really do a lot of uh, question and answers with birds, but we have to look at their behaviors. So, everyone's familiar with the American robins. Um, it sings at first perceptible light. And in 1929, over the course of the year, people were uh, mapping out the time of the initial uh, song by uh, robins. And in April, we see times near uh, 6 a.m. By June, when the um, time of sunrise was earlier, that drops closer to just about 5, a little after 5 uh, a.m. And so this is what we saw at that time. Now, that was long before we had a lot of light pollution. So fast forward to 2003, and we see the whole curve has shifted. And in the summertime, in early June, we're now seeing an average start of singing at around 4 a.m., so a little over an hour earlier. And this is because of the brightening of the night sky by artificial light. So we know that the additional light is triggering this. So is this a behavioral effect or a hormonal effect? Well, we can't divine that from this information alone, so we actually have to do some more work. And uh, work was done on a very closely related bird in Europe, the European blackbird, which is not related to blackbirds here in North America, but it's actually a close cousin of the American robin. And they looked at two different uh, populations, one an urban one and one a, a rural one. And what they did here was they actually measured the melatonin levels in the blood plasma. And with light at night, they saw lower melatonin, as we might have expected, and greater pre-dawn activity, just like the robins in the North American study exposed to, to more light at night. In wintertime, the birds uh, with light at night had lower melatonin concentrations early and late at night. And in the summertime, the light at night birds had lower melatonin concentrations throughout the night. So that light was suppressing the 
build up of melatonin that I showed you in that one curve, which was for humans, but is true for, for most animals. So what's a long-term effect then on these European blackbirds, which of course are cousins of our uh, North American, American robins? Well, dark rural settings, normal annual sexual and molt cycles were found in the birds. In lit urban uh, situations, the first year males actually matured faster sexually, but second year males saw no reproductive development. So basically they didn't recognize the seasons because there was too much light at night. And this led to an irregular molt sequence. Well, why was this happening? Probably two effects. The primary one being that they're what they're stuck in is a photorefractory state, that the light is suppressing the ability of their normal hormones to regulate their seasonal behavior and their daily behavior in terms of their hormones. And chronic stress, the secondary effect, will also weaken birds. So it's International Migratory Bird Day. What about them? Can light pollution create problems for migration as well? In a word, yes. Annual cycles of light and dark modify the daily rhythms. For migratory birds, the onset of migratory restlessness is triggered by day-night length. And if you artificially shorten those nights in their wintering areas in the south, it can trigger an onset of migration that's too early. And that means a bird moving northwards would have a mismatch between the food sources along its spring migration path, as well as the at the arrival at the summer breeding area, it might not have all the food sources ready for it. In the fall, if it's in an area with a lot of light at night, that could mean that birds linger too long before heading, before heading south, and they may be exposed to uh, very bad weather. So why is this an issue? Well, it turns out warblers and a lot of other small birds migrate at night due to cooler temperatures, denser air, less turbulence, and they avoid a lot of their main hawk and crow predators. And there's another reason, there's kind of an odd one, possibility of star navigation. And this was actually proven in a study of uh, a particular bird called an indigo bunting. It's a small bluish bird and they also fly at night. And it turns out over the course of the uh, raising of the young, the young learn the pattern of stars in the night sky, in the circumpolar sky, which is the part of the sky that stays above the horizon at all times. So they basically learn what we would call the Big Dipper, uh, Ursa Minor, Cepheus, and Cassiopeia, with its M or W shape, depending on the time of the year. Now, why is that an issue? Well, think about the light pollution from major urban settings. We've got Calgary and Edmonton, for example, in this diagram, and that's the, the light that's directly shining upwards, so uplight as uh, we researchers in light pollution like to call it. But that brightens the night sky over a broad area. And when we think about what that does, here's the influence of the uplight on the sky glow, the brightness of the night sky. You can easily imagine then that birds migrating in these areas would have a tougher time if they are ones that choose to navigate by stars when the, when the sky is clear. So light pollution, specifically the sky glow portion of light pollution, has the potential for large-scale disorientation of nocturnally migrating songbirds. Light pollution can also kill birds at a more local scale. For example, each year in Toronto, over a million birds are killed by colliding with buildings. And the Fatal Light Awareness Program, FLAP, um, has been a, a vanguard organization for this. And in today's um, overall program, you've heard Kathleen talk about the work that's being done in the Calgary downtown with bird collisions and uh, with buildings. You would think, wouldn't illuminated buildings and structures be safer than dark ones? Our human brains think so, which is why we light things up at night. But I'll give you a counter example I think you can all identify with, and that's this situation. We're used to winter driving and we would not think of using our high beams because this is the result. It looks like we've gone to warp in a Star Wars or Star Trek movie. So there are situations where light 
shining indiscriminately are not very good for our vision and wayfinding. And this is much more true for birds who obviously have a very different perception of the value of light at night. So why do lit buildings attract and kill birds? We simply do not know. We think that they can be confused by nighttime lights. And here's a building in Calgary um, with all of its lights on. And I draw your attention to the other image, which is a, a typical boreal forest scene. And if you're a small bird living in that forest, as many of our migrating songbirds would in the summertime, uh, would you be flying into the light areas or into dark areas on that photograph? And then think, if you're a bird flying through the downtown area of Calgary, would you be flying into the light areas or dark areas on that building? So I think birds probably have deep rooted insights and behaviors that we just can't understand, but maybe this is one of the things that leads to the devastating effects of light uh, at night, particularly with lit buildings and structures. And it can be a solid structure as well. Birds will fly into uh, illuminated walls uh, because they think that's a portal or a way through. The other thing is that birds don't want to fly out of a lit area once they're uh, in it. And they can, for example, and this is a heartbreaking example from New York City with the Tribute in Light. All of those white spots on the screen there are birds trapped in the beams of light and they will fly around until they drop to the ground from exhaustion. Now, nowadays, this is a recognized problem. And of course, uh, September 11th happens in the middle of the fall migration period for songbirds. And now there are bird spotters and these lights are turned off for about 15 minutes until all birds clear out before they're being re-illuminated. But this is a, a, a clear problem that birds are puzzled and attracted by light at night. I'm going to give you another example. It's an Alberta example and it's not even with songbirds. We had a huge uh, duck and geese kill at uh, one of the oil sands uh, facilities in northern Alberta and basically what happened on a night with uh, very poor conditions, foggy, sleet and so on, uh, very few natural visual cues for birds to navigate by. And we, we had uh, over 500 birds land and die on tailings ponds at an oil sand site. And they chose to land on those ponds instead of clean natural ponds or the adjacent Athabasca River or even unlit tailings ponds. It turns out the, the birds were drawn in because they could identify a reflective surface because of the artificial light that was used uh, on at these work sites. Why would they be drawn that way? Well, we think that birds quite often will use the reflection of moon and starlight off of water as a way to navigate. And in the vicinity of those oil sands plants, the Athabasca River is a north-south corridor, so it's a very convenient way for birds moving north and south during the spring and fall migration to just follow along the river. But if the river's not lit and the tailings ponds are, or at least some of them are, we'll find that the birds will be probably drawn to this because that's the only visual cue they have. Keep in mind that most cities are situated along major rivers, as is Calgary, and artificial lighting can give confusing patterns for birds to understand because normally when they're flying, the only lights below them in a natural environment is reflected natural light from the moon and the stars off of water bodies. In cities, they're flying along and they have street lights, house lights, security lighting of all manner of description and it can be very confusing for them. So lighting within a bird friendly city. Some tips. Use only when necessary for safety. Turns out light at night does not reduce crime at night, and the best design studies show the opposite's actually true, that it moves some of the nighttime, uh, sorry, some of the daytime crime into the nighttime. Tips for using light when you need it. 
minimize stray light. Aim at where it is needed. Avoid upward light, as in the example uh, photo there. Minimize the blue or white light. It scatters more in air and directly impacts the melatonin production. We saw those pillars of light in, the, for, in New York City because it was mostly blue that was scattering back. Blue also happens to be the light that most impacts our melatonin production at night. And reduce glare and contrast by using the only, only the amount of light needed. Avoid overlighting. And in Calgary, uh, was, we've got some pretty good regulations, and there's always room for improvement, of course. But we've got the land use bylaw, which mandates light shielding and also the brightness of digital signs. The Community Standards Bylaw regulates light trespass from one property to another. You cannot have light shining into the dwelling spaces of an adjacent uh, home um, without contravening the Community Standards Bylaw. So you have some recourse if your neighbor is shining lights into your house inadvertently or, or on purpose. And as well, the City Centre Illumination Guidelines educates on topics of the need for complementary darkness minimizing large-scale flood lighting and being sensitive to birds. So this is, uh, we made uh, pretty good uh, use of these terms here for our bird-friendly city and we thank all those who came before who passed those regulations. And finally, if you're looking for more information, uh, my organization, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, has a local web page we also do delve a lot into light pollution and responsible lighting. And there are a couple of Twitter accounts, one that's specifically about uh, light pollution and ecology, uh, nocturnal ecology, and that's the RASC underscore LTA, light pollution abatement account. And our local club has a Calgary RASC uh, Twitter account. And finally, I'm going to really uh, highlight a couple of Facebook pages. One's about nocturnally migrating songbirds and connectivity for them, as well as Bird Friendly Calgary, who's been hosting today's programming. We have a Facebook page, Bird Friendly Calgary. Thank you for your attention.